From the forgetful studios of Univest at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, it's time for another Hey, Look at What I Found episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks You Bet Your Garden. Are you one of many who just found a bag of unplanted spring bulbs in the basement? How about perennials that never got planted? Perhaps a bag of grass seed that should have been spread in September? I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and on today's show, we'll reveal how to handle these out-of-season orphans. Otherwise, it's a fabulous phone call show, Cassie Kittens. That's right. Potential guests are busy searching the cellar. So we will take that heap and help it. Of your telecommunicative questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and immensely important interpretation. So keep your eyes and or ears, true believers, because it's all coming up faster than you having tulips in July right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Public Media Center in Bethlehem, PA. I am your uninvested host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, so many of you are digging back in your closets and your garages and basements and cellars, and you're finding things you were supposed to plant back in the fall, aren't you? Wow, look at that big box of tulips. Whoa, this grass seed was supposed to go in, and these perennials are sprouting. What can you do now? We'll be happy to tell you after lots of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Sarah, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being had. How are you doing? I'm great. And where is Sarah great? I am great in Portsmouth, Virginia. Oh, in the Tidewater area. Exactly. Okay, sure. I know that area really well. <laughs> and I should, shouldn't should say that, but I, I just love going down to the little places like Sandbridge and Pungo. For sure. When's the last time somebody else mentioned Pungo to you? Come on. Uh, we were just talking about the Strawberry Festival in Pungo very recently. Well, when and unfortunately, is that? it's canceled this year. Oh, that's no fun. And uh, congrats, uh, Cucaracha, uh, congratulations are in order. I understand you have a brand new granddaughter. I do. She is a doll. Her name is Josie, and She's almost seven months. Okay. Well, congratulations to you. All right. Well, it's nice talking to you. We'll see you next week. You know. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? What could we do for Sarah? Well, um, I, the happy news, aside from my granddaughter, is that my husband and I are retiring um, in the upcoming months. Mm -hmm. We love it here in Portsmouth, but mm -hmm. our hearts are going to be um, even more full down in Beaufort, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really pretty happy about it. It's one half of a growing zone warmer down there, mm -hmm. so very much. So. I, all yeah. my skills will translate. But I'm really sad to be leaving my garden behind, especially mm -hmm. some sentimental items like some Lenten rose that were given to me by a dear friend, and some peonies that were also a very nice gift from a friend. Oh, man. So my question is, can I take them with me across state lines? Is that safe? And is it legal? Um, well, those are two good questions. It is not legal to remove anything from the ground if you're selling a home without the express consent of the new homeowner. So that you can't just, they can't just show up on move-in day and find craters in in the front Correct. yard but i have some time could i dig them up now transport them to my new house no that doesn't count that's without my penny that's just fraud <laughs> no if you're going to sell the house you have to leave the plants in the ground um uh a realtor taught me this you know if you go into a living room and there's recessed lights in the ceiling 
they belong to the um, to the house. If there's pictures hanging on the wall, they belong to you. So um, your landscaping, technically, because it is permanent until you kill it, um, belongs to the house. So first, you would okay. have to, you know, you would have to figure out who's doing that. Then your second question is uh, really, uh, really astute. And it's something we don't go into as much. Now, you're moving, you said south or north? We're moving south to Beaufort, South Carolina from south, Southern Virginia. South Carolina. So you're going you're gonna to skip north. Correct. Drive right through. Okay. What I would do right away is contact your local um, county extension service, and they may be able to give you what's called the Certificate of Sanitation. I personally have oh. never gotten one, but I haven't asked for plants either. And what that does is somebody comes out and, you know, watches you as you pull it out of the ground. They scrub it. They may take a sample. And then you're told, okay, good to go not good to go. And the same with, um, what was the other plant? Oh, the Lenten oh, rose. and um, hellebores. Mm. Oh. I, are you really sure you want to transplant the hellebores? Because they're right there in the ground. I know. Okay, what about fig cuttings or the like plants in pots that I've brought inside and outside? Oh, if they're in pots, they belong to you. Okay. Um, fig cuttings, easy peasy. Um, you know, just talk to your local extension agent about having them inspected. And then talk to okay. your new county extension agent about having them inspect, uh, inspected. And if they both say, gee, thank you for calling, but there's no problem... Um, you're good. But if you call and they go, oh my God, we just had this horrible fig beetle pest come out of nowhere, um, then you know that you did the right thing by calling and you're just going to have to grow your own new fig. Okay. I can handle that. Okay. But well, those, that's great. those are intelligent questions. And I will mention as a prelude our dear friend, Lee Reich, uh, one of the great fruit growers in America, has a new book on figs, and I'll be interviewing him in a couple of weeks. Oh, I look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Mike. I will. This will possibly soften the blow of having to leave my garden behind. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure you can take some of it, but there's some of it that would be, for instance, have you ever tried to dig up a peony? No. Oh, man. I stopped when the street signs started being in Chinese. <laughs> okay. They are deep-rooted. So, so, you know, um, what would probably be better is just to find the variety, name the variety, and, and grow them fresh. Okay. I'll do that. Because, again, without the permission, you can't take nothing. Yeah, and I don't want to transplant these horrible hammerhead worms that have been all over the internet. Um, I don't want to take them anywhere. And, and Hammerhead or jumping worms? The, oh, gosh. No, hammerhead or jumping? They, they're jumping where? No, no, jumping worms. They are the latest invasive species. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I thought they were. They look like hammerhead sharks and worms crossed, so I thought they were called hammerhead worms. Well, they, now could, I know. they could well be... Um, so uh, uh, one of the things when I mentioned that before I skipped over it, they're going to want to see the bare roots. You're not going to transplant any okay. soil. That's a given. Okay. Okay? Okay. Great. All right. Well, good luck I, to you. I've, I know my ag extension agent by first name. Good. So I will give her a call. Excellent. And, uh, and get some certifications. Yeah. Okay, well, good luck Thanks, to you, Mike. and good luck with the move, and good luck with uh, Trixie. What's her name? Uh, uh, Josie. Josie. You know. Our baby Josie. <laughs> well, thanks again. My pleasure. Take care.
doesn't smile She's beautiful, sweet and more The black-eyed Susan of a seaport town The town of Baltimore Chesapeake girl, you're so pretty Chesapeake girl, you're so fine Chesapeake girl, how I love you And someday You're gonna be my I met her at a high school dance She was beautiful to see All the boys wanted to dance with her But she would only dance with me Chesapeake girl, you're so pretty Chesapeake girl, you're so fine Chesapeake gonna be mine It's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody that tick season is here. And you should give a lot of thought to avoiding these disease-carrying bloodsuckers. Don't walk through brushy areas without protection. The best protection is permethrin-treated clothing. The spray goes on your clothes, not on your skin. But don't go looking up the details at our website just yet because we'll be right back with more details on planting last year's flowers and fields. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, I'm sure a lot of you are finding surprises in your basement and your garage. Oh, these should have been planted in the fall. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to tell you what to do about it when we get to the question of the week. In the meantime, more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. James, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi. Hi, James. How are you? I am great, and uh, I'm calling about invasive species. Okay. Well, we got plenty of them. Where are you, man? Um, I am in Lower Alsace Township, which is right outside of Reading. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, Reading was blessed with two beautiful, I guess they're actually hills, but we call them mountains. Right. Mount Penn and Mount Neversink. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm in part of a group that manages uh, the mountain preserves 
And we're trying to do something about the invasive species that are all over both mountains, and especially the Japanese barberry. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, it's everywhere, and uh, it crowds out the understory. And from what I understand, it's a, a, a good home for deer ticks that carry Lyme disease. I, I would say no better a home than any other. I mean, that's a spiny plant, and people are right. not going to rub up against it as much as they would a tall grass. Right, yes. Um, but may, maybe the deer and the mice would rub up against it and you know, carry it. To, uh, now you've our seen homes, this. Backyard. You've seen this in quantity. Ain't nobody rubbing up against it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's pretty painful. Yeah, um, and you. These are the kind of plants that were used as living fences uh, to separate oh, properties okay. and and prevent children from running next door. Uh, right. You know, unless they want to get all bloody. So. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Japanese barberry is um, a medium-sized shrub, right, three feet to six feet, all kind of prickly, and it has really nice berries in the, in the fall, but we can't use them, but birds eat them, then they poop them out someplace else, and boom, there's more Japanese. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah, bearberry. Um, yeah. Um, I, there was a, a uh, native barberry, I believe— and uh, I looked at, up some information on it, and it, it seems to be hard to find these days. It's called American Barberry. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the Japanese just smothered it out. I'm not sure. Japanese Barberry smothered it out. Well, there, there's also a European that helped with that, too. So, you know, as, yeah. as, as we move <laughs> further and further to extinction, I think these um, imaginary lines between planting areas mean less and less. Now, right. what do you yeah. want to do with the mountaintops? That's always the first question. Ignore. Well, we, we okay. Go. We want we want to preserve it in its natural state, but also make it accessible for people for hiking and mountain biking, uh, bird watching. Uh, you name it. It's uh, we're really blessed with these two mountains, right? And they're beautiful. Um, and, so do you uh, and, just, and right now it's just rugged, uh, all these stickly plants, and you want to do something. Well, what's happening is that uh, people are getting their yard waste and throwing it on the edges of the mountain preserve, mm -hmm. and a lot of the yard waste have invasive species in mm -hmm. them, and they're starting to spread onto the mountain. Uh, so we're we're going to try an educational program for the neighbors to have them recognize what an invasive species is and not to dump it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know. But, uh, you know, getting eradicating them just seems to be impossible. And then I was wondering if you had any ideas. Well, again, um, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, I presume this is a blank slate. Uh, you want to put in, uh, bike trails and walking trails and things like that. Well, they, there, there are. There's a lot of those already. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a history of uh, being developed uh, for the last 200 years, and um, we just want to preserve what is there. There's uh, a, a bike club. The uh, uh, International Mountain Biking Association has right. a local chapter in Berks County, and and they do a great job of maintaining the trails. So are, is, is the is the Barbary invading the trails? Uh, it, it will. <laughs> okay. It will be. It's it's moving. It's moving up the mountain, and uh, it's uh, it's just everywhere. And okay. Well, um, one answer is selective flame weeding. You know, flame weeding, okay. flame weeding. Like right about now, I, I think it's beginning to set flowers inconspicuous ones and then uh -huh. they'll, they'll grow into fruits by the end of uh, the season well if you burn right. if you burn the flowers or even in between during a dry stage there won't be any fruits so that right. okay. that, that will slowly move you in the correct direction have you ever investigated right. goats <laughs> i'm serious no, but 
Real, ser- yeah. Yeah. Um, Take well, a look. we need a lot of them. <laughs> well, that they come in numbers. They come in numbers. Yeah. Um, but obviously, okay. you're going to have to get financing for this. Right. Yeah. We, we, we do have some financing uh, through the American Rescue Plan. Okay. You know, and uh, we have some money that we can spend on uh, uh, trail improvement and mm-hmm. preservation and education and other, other things that would yeah. help the My two the answers are, to, well, first of all, you got to protect the base of the mountain. People can't keep dumping there. Right, yeah. So you got to work. Yeah, absolutely. You got to work work with your, I don't know if it's EPA, park rangers, something like that. But you gotta, you gotta stop right. that. And then I would think uh, selective flame weeding, which is a lot of fun, okay. very effective, um, would do a good job. And if weed eating goats will eat barberry. Um, then you're set. That's a good question. Yeah, they show up by the hundreds, and they fence them in, yeah. and they eat all the invasive plants, and then they uh, move them along. So, no, that's interesting. Yeah, it's and a, you need to talk to a good grant writer um, to get yeah, the to get right. the money to back all this up. But it can be done. I mean, it's not the worst weed. You just have to keep at it and be clever. Okay. Uh, yeah, I. I, I'm sort of at the point that we have to kind of just live with these invasive species that we're not going to ever eradicate them. They've become so entrenched and, in, you know, it's uh, it's almost a hopeless case. But, you know, those are it's good not, ideas you have. Yeah, it's not yeah. hopeless, for instance, like with Multiflora Rose, as long as I can get up and prune every season. And if I can't do that, to hire somebody to prune them back. They're in stasis, right. and I love the smell, and I love the flowers yeah. when they bloom. So, mm-hmm. yeah, learn to live with them is is really the right way to look at this. Um, but I, I think you've got some good plans there. You need to define them better. Go to the township. Um, you know, right. there's grants out there to do this. And But basically, to answer your question, flame weeders and goats. Okay, uh, that sounds good. All right, um, man. One other thing. I want to thank you so much for talking about garlic oil in treating in uh, mosquito eradication. All right. Um, I listened to your show a couple of years ago, and you, and you brought that up. I use it every season religiously now, and there are no mosquitoes in my yard. Right, the garlic sprays. The, yeah, the garlic spray. It's garlic oil spray. and Yeah, I, I got that from you, and thank you so much. My pleasure. We haven't we haven't talked about that for a while. I'll have to I'll have to bring that no. up again. But thank you. Yeah, my my yard smells like an Italian restaurant, but that's okay. Nothing too. wrong with that. Okay. No. <laughs> Good luck right, to you, thank sir. Thank you so much, Mike. My pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. Zana, welcome to you. Bet your garden. Hey, Mike. How are you doing? I'm good, Zana. How are you? Oh, I should say, how am I doing? I'm, I'm ducky. I'm very <laughs> ducky, yes. I almost missed so my cue I'm there. Calling, I'm calling from, from Lambsdale, PA, a bit south of you. Okay. And I'm calling, we have a, a rose bush that we planted in honor of our son's birth two years ago. Right. And we're about to move into a temporary place. We're planning to take the rose bush with us. But the problem is that there's not a place to plant it in the ground. Um, we might be there for up to six months. Um, I have not had luck keeping roses alive in containers before, so I'm mm-hmm. hoping that you'll have some tips. Okay. Do you have permission to take the rose bush? I do. We we included that in our contract when we when we sold the house that so we were definitely going to take that rose bush. How tall is the bush? It's about two feet tall. Okay. Um, and you say you're going to move to an in-between place. Yes. And then do you have that next place settled out? Not yet. We've been trying to buy a house, but it's a pretty crazy market right now. I hear that. Well, you know, this is a good time. Uh, why don't we try to leave that thing in the ground and make this a lot easier? Uh, roses are incredibly good at rooting, 
So what I'm going to suggest is when the new growth appears uh, pretty soon, wait like two weeks and then cut off whips like a foot long of the nicest new growth. Um, have maybe how many how many roses do you want to try to make? You want to make four, six? Um, get a oh gosh, I hadn't thought of of taking cuttings. So get a bunch of oh yeah, this is the easier way. Uh, get a bunch of pots and fill them with a combination of potting soil, compost, and perlite. And using a pencil, good size pots, uh, make a hole in the potting soil mixture and drop the cut end of the rose bush in. Recut it right before you do this. And drop that in. Don't shove it down because you'll injure the tissue. Uh, drop it in. Let's say you're going to put three whips in each container. And then you water them really well. And ideally, you set up a humidity tent, you know, like the bags from the dry cleaners and stuff, you mm -hmm. know, to keep everything moist in there. And uh, you should continue to see moistness on the inside of the bags. So if you don't mist it, keep it misted, but don't overwater it. And you can take the bags off when you see new growth. And then eventually okay. you can choose which of those three you want to keep. And you can do that many times. It's, uh, it's remarkably easy if you don't go off, uh, go off uh, script. You know, just perlite, um, compost, and potting soil, organic potting soil. And make sure they stay well misted. And then take the bag off, you know, when you see new growth. And then just put them somewhere in dappled light where, um, you know, they're not going to get, you know, burned up and they're not going to get too cold. Just, you know, morning sun, afternoon shade would be ideal. And because they're in pots, you can do that. Um, okay. And then you should have a, a great variety of the same rows. And... You know, if you screw up, you can always go back and ask for the plant, right? Right. Or, you know, steal in the dead of night and just take some cuttings. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you want to read up on it, there's articles on rooting roses on um, our website at the garden answers section. Um, but uh, I, this uh, figs and roses are, to, uh, to me, two of the easiest plants to root. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mike. All right. Good luck to you.
Well, it's time for me to take a little break and alert everyone out there who has a miserable mosquito season every year that the worst thing you can do to prevent this problem is to have your lawn and landscape sprayed. All that does is kill off the bees and beneficials you're relying on. To take care of mosquitoes, get ahead of the game. Get some BTI granules, that's Bacillus thuris and gensis, but it'll have a picture of a mosquito on the front. And put some of the granules in small dishes of water and change the water frequently. Female mosquitoes will lay their eggs in that water, but no viable mosquitoes will escape. Pretty cool, huh? But don't go looking for all the details at our website just yet because we'll be right back with what to do with all those orphans of the storm you just found in the basement. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Public Media Center in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at the Lehigh Valley Public Media Center in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we're in the stretch now, cats and kittens. In just a little bit, we'll tell you what to do with all those things you were supposed to plant last fall and you found in the basement last week. We're also going to try to re-explain what you should do with bare root plants when they show up because we screwed it up royally a couple of weeks ago. But that's all coming up after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Mike, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Mike. (laughs) How are you? I'm pretty good for an old guy. Okay. You know, I won't ask how old because I'm there too. (laughs) And where is Mike doing pretty good for an old guy? Georgetown, Delaware. Georgetown, Delaware. Okay, okay. Um, I know where that is. I like the Delaware beaches a lot. Um, What can we do for Mike in the other Georgetown, let's call it? Yeah. Well, about a year, a little over a year ago, I found my favorite tree. And it's called a monkey puzzle tree. Ha, 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 ha. They are crazy-looking things, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, I had seen, we had seen them in England, but they grew, it was about 40 feet tall, the one I saw. Wow. But there were some smaller ones, and my daughter in Eugene, Oregon, had them growing in her neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So I said, I have to have them. So I did grow one, and it, it had... Um, we purchased one, oh, two or three, four years ago, and it had scale, and it died. And this one is, is about eight feet tall, and the bottom branches are turning brown. And I, I had some oozing, like, clear stuff coming out the ends of a couple of these branches. I don't mm-hmm. know what it was. I sprayed them with uh, neem oil, RTU. Okay. And also, I have horticultural and dormant spray. Mm-hmm. But I haven't sprayed that one yet, but I just want to know, is there a way to save this tree? Because the bottom two branches now have turned almost t- totally brown. Well, you know, this is an evergreen, and yes. all evergreens will eventually turn brown at the bottom if they don't get enough sun down there. So is okay. the... well, this, this one's out in the sun. Yeah, but I mean from all sides? Um. Pretty much. I mean, it doesn't really get shady because where it's planted, it's planted in. We have about an acre of grass, and it's planted. There's there are a couple of trees near it, but but it's not not in the shade by any means. And what you know, is it? Branches are pretty, what uh, is it in? Is it growing in, out of the lawn? Well, yes. Mm-hmm. Do you keep yes. the, Do you keep the grass away from it somehow? Uh, a little bit, you know. There's there's no grass close to it, but there, you know, there's a little bit of. When we planted it, I kept the dirt there. We didn't put anything around it, no mulch or anything mm-hmm. like that. We put mulch in the hole. Uh, I I, I have my own um, 
mulch pile that we that we make, you know. Okay. The, and and I put some in the bottom, and it, that was pretty rich, and it it did well. I mean, it's been mm-hmm. doing well, except we got this oozing stuff at the ends. I did cut the oozing stuff off, right? Figuring that maybe whatever was was affecting it. However, it it looks good from the top down to the, the last two or three branches on the very bottom row. Yeah, that's typical, unfortunately. Of it is. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to correct you: when you plant a tree or a shrub, uh, you do not improve the soil in the planting hole. Um, you make okay. you make the plant grow in the soil that you have, and then you quote mulch around the plant with compost. But yeah, that's Im- what we improving compost. the soil yeah. in the planting hole only makes the roots want to stay tight in one spot. So that could be affecting okay. it. We dug the hole according to the the uh, the people where we bought the tree from. You know, right. like it was six inches w- bigger on each around than than the ball, and they they lowered it into the hole mm-hmm. because it, you know, in fact, they even widened it more okay. and lowered it into the hole because it was heavy. You know, and yes. plus, you don't handle these trees very easily. No, um, you so, did. So you think. They did remove uh-huh. all the wrappings and everything, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, indeed they did. So they, they knew about doing that. Okay. And um, was it planted it, deep? Uh, well, up to the top of the ball. You know, it didn't, okay, we, no, that's we fine. Didn't plant it. That's fine. Yeah, the ball was just a little above the level of the grass. Mm-hmm. And you say right now it looks good except for the bottom two sets of branches yeah i'd say bottom two maybe the third branch is kind of browning but yeah the bottom three branches are and i've already cut one off a while ago right because it was totally totally dead mm-hmm. so you think that i well that i mean it could have been dominant. planted better but that's always you know everybody disagrees about that so um okay. and it's about to produce new growth right yes there's light green on the tips of the branches going all the way up to the top and right on the top there's the lighter green color uh, branches or whatever you call them leaves or spine i don't know what you call them people who are listening on the radio (laughs) or podcast got to look up the monkey puzzle plant it is it reminds me of the barrel of monkeys you know the plastic monkeys (laughs) that we get played with as kids so anyway, well, it's the national tree of, of Chile. Oh, something had to be. And, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I love seeing them in people's landscapes. So yeah. um, when the when the new growth starts, wait yes. like three weeks, and then if there's no sign of anything happening on those lower branches, trim them off. If there's okay. some, if there's some brown and some green, just trim off the brown. Um, mulch the plant really well with two inches of compost and keep it evenly watered during dry times if they ever occur. Okay. But I don't think there's anything really wrong. Good. All right. Well, that saves me because, it, like I say, it's my prized tree. It's one that I, oh, I love them. Yeah. to get. And when I found it, it you know, it was at a, at a place that was going out of business, and so they sold it to me for a lot less than they were asking. So. All right. It was uh, three hundred dollars for the tree. Yeah, well, a good tree costs a good tree costs good money. I think you made a good investment. Yeah, it's a beautiful tree. Exactly. Well, thank you, thank you for your advice, and we'll see how it works. Okay, very good. You take uh, care now. Thanks, Mike. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Appreciate. It. Bye. Well, it is time for the question of the week, which we are calling forgotten bulbs and the real deal on bare-rooted plants. Now, Scott Johnson on Winding Brook Manor, which is somewhere near me here in Easton, PA, wrote on my Next Door site, which is a great program. Health problems prevented us from getting in some perennials, tulip bulbs, and grass seed in the fall. We kept everything in our unheated garage over the winter. Some of the perennials have started to sprout. Should we plant everything now and see what happens? Well, you should certainly plant those sprouting perennials. 
wait for a somewhat dry stretch, and install them as you would normally. They should react the same as if you bought them yesterday. Note, as I pound these words into my defenseless keyboard, it is sopping wet with a wetter week to come, and it's never a good idea to work in wet soil. So be patient. You got them this far, don't screw it up now. The spring bulbs are a bit dicier. If you had written back in January, I would have urged you to pot them up in organic potting soil and place the pots in that energy-wasting beer fridge you got in the basement. After 12 weeks for daffodils and 16 for tulips, the pots can be taken outside, and there's a good chance these pre-chilled bulbs will flower nicely. But that's only if they're in tune with the season. Forcing them to bloom outside of spring requires special equipment, lots of knowledge, and lots of luck. But it is a great option if you move aside some Christmas lights and you find a box of forgotten bulbs back in December. Move those bulbs into pots into a fridge that contains no fruit. Wait 12 weeks for daffodils, 16 for tulips. Put them outside and you'll have a darn good chance. But alas, it is not just temperature and timing. The necks of the bulbs must emerge at a certain period of celestial events to induce flower formation. You can't sidestep this one. But I notice that no tulips have yet emerged in my garden of wonders. I wonder why anything can grow there. So I would plant those leftovers ASAP, and they may decide to flower on time. Your locale is definitely warmer than mine. So for this to work well, I suggest you fire up the Wayback Machine and drop back to mid-April. But you got nothing to lose. They won't wait another year, so plan them now. Even if all you get is leaves, don't cut those leaves back this season. Let them turn brown naturally, and you should have flowers the following spring. That grass seed, store it in a mouse-proof container until August. The soil is much too cold to do anything with it now. And finally, we move on with apologies to David in Alexandria, who received one of the most mixed-up, bollocksed answers I have ever delivered on the show a couple weeks ago. He wrote, a local government agency has a bare root seedling sale, and this year I purchased two each of American Hornbeam, Canadian Serviceberry, and Wineberry Holly. I'll be picking up my new trees on April 1st and expect them to be a good size. I know generally where I want to plant them, but the areas aren't quite ready for new trees for a variety of reasons. One spot is an existing zoysia lawn and I need to remove the grass. Another has existing dense, weedy, and invasive brush that I need to remove. The final spot is a mossy, shady spot of the yard with some pretty spotty grass and a few weeds. Probably the easiest area to prepare, except I also have a new shed being installed and would like that project to be done before planting a new tree that might end up just getting trampled in the work zone. So can I pot up these bare root seedlings for now and plant them in the fall? From listening to your show, I know that's the best time to plant trees generally. But will I be losing any kind of advantage if I pot up those bare root seedlings? If potting them isn't the worst idea, what size pot should I put them in? And what kind of potting medium should I use? And do you have any suggestions on how to prepare these different areas I will be planting them in? Thanks for your time. Looking forward to your advice. Ah, but those congratulations certainly came from you before you received the first run of bogus advice on our radio and TV show, David. I was watching that show first run a couple of Saturdays ago. Your call came up. And I was quickly screaming at myself on the TV, make up your mind, tell them to plant them or pot them, or at least tell them to run them over with a pickup truck and get it over with. Anyway, without delving into my normal bag of pointless excuses, sunspots, 
David knew exactly what to do. Glad one of us did. When you receive bare root plants in the spring and don't know what to do with them, or they're impossibly small, you first sit each bare root plant in a bucket of water for an hour or two, then pot them up into a mixture of organic potting soil, compost, and perlite. If they're really tiny, like those Arbor Day sprouts, place them in medium-sized pots. Otherwise, make sure the pot is twice as large as the root ball. If you drop those pots into a big pile of mulch, you won't have to worry about watering them so much. Otherwise, just put them in dappled sunlight and wait till September 2nd. Well, that sure was some interesting information about planting a procrastinator's garden, now wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. To read it over again at your leisure or your leisure, just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden question of the week, and you will always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website. Yikes, my producer is threatening to rehide my recently discovered spring bulbs. If I don't get out of this studio, we must be out of time. But you can contact us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt. Dot O-R-G. Please include your location. How hard can it be? You're giving me conniptions. Is that right? Conniptions? You'll find all of this contact information at our website, youbetyourgarden.org, where you'll also find the answers to many of your garden questions, audio of this show, video of this show, audio and video of previous shows, and our n- internet, n- 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 our popular podcast. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all delivered to you weekly from the Univest studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when he solved the riddle of time travel, went back to the age of the woolly mammoths, and accidentally stepped on his great-grandfather 20 times removed. <clears throat> Ken Queter plays our theme music. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our sound engineer is always cheerful, Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Teresa Radke is our peerless princess of profound production. The always lovely Jonas Bowen is our audio editor. Judicious Jake Boyer does the video. Our directorial director of direction is the harassed and harried Javier Diaz. Zach the Tack Wisniewski is reportedly back in the house, ably assisted by the usual gang of idiots, which often and sometimes includes Eric Werner, Jacob Morris, Jeff Frederick, and many more too expensive to mention. Our beloved CEO Tim Fallon was just overheard in the hallway looking at this studio and going, is that thing still on the air? I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and yes, I is still on the air. And I'm brewing some hard compost tea so I can celebrate International Compost Awareness Week properly. And so I will see you again next week.
Yeah.